I've been waiting fucking 15 years of my life to get my hands on a guitar like this. I'm the infamous Orion. I'm a damn happy camper. And I'm Cairo. And I'm also a schmo. <laughs> I love this thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> welcome to the Two Schmo Show, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, otherwise, uh, we've been gone for a few weeks. Yeah, lots of happenings. Lots and lots of happenings. God damn. Uh, I want to say this episode is dedicated to Doge on the front end. Absolutely. I can't pronounce Doge's real name for the life of me. Kyro, can you? Kabosu? Kabosu, yeah. Okay. The fucking hard part about being dyslexic is every time I see a word I don't immediately recognize, I'm afraid to ever pronounce it. Yeah, it's tricky. Especially, I, I guess, uh, like, Japanese is slightly easier because it's highly phonetic, but a lot of non-Anglo languages have weird pronunciations that <laughs> you, you'd think they'd have a better way you know it's like it's 2024 i think we can maybe not like add new english letters of course that would probably piss off too many people <laughs> but like just use like umlauts and shit like that more a accents right we can we can handle it i 1000 percent agree with that i wish we had like um <laughs> A better way of signifying when uh, we had hard consonants versus no, sorry, hard vowels versus uh, soft vowels. Mm hmm. It would help a lot. Really, I, like, and <laughs> we we take it for granted with English because of how much our words kind of like paper off to the end if it ends with a, a vowel. Yeah, and that's just not the case in like most other languages. <laughs> What can we say? We're poetic as fuck. I guess. No, no, we're not. How has your uh, your last two weeks been, Cairo? Boy, it's it's been a, a bit. Um, from I, I I'm curious to hear how this compares to the last uh, recording we had because uh, I've been going through a bit of a sinus thing these last couple of weeks and I finally got some medicine for it and I feels like I'm sounding better, definitely feeling better. But, yeah, that's just been kind of like uh, a constant thing that has been ongoing. Speaking it's as like, the guy who mixes your audio, you sound a lot better. <laughs> you don't realize how big your sinuses are until they all hurt. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, glad to be hopefully on the other side of that. But it's been busy, right? We haven't had a show in like three weeks now, I think. Has it been? Th okay, one moment. Let me go check. Like three business weeks, I guess would be the way I would business put it. Weeks. We we missed the last two uh, dates. Who are we, John Oliver? Yeah, apparently. Yeah. Our writers went on strike. Everybody. <laughs> Okay. Oh, we got a new subscriber. Thank you. Hell yeah. Oh my god, we're on episode 153 right now. Jeez. It's adding up. Isn't it? <laughs> mm-hmm. You don't realize... I, was, it. Man, Go on. I saw that... For, which was it? I think it was... Um, do you know the musician Tiesto? Sounds familiar. Please tell me more. Uh, dance musician who's been around since, like, the 80s. If I had to say, and he does uh, a near weekly, um, like not really a podcast, but like track list that he puts out where it's like an, an hour a week. He puts together a set list of remixes that he has done and stuff that he is just a fan of that he's you know showcasing. And this last week he put out 
episode 894. That's probably closer to what we are when you factor in the college episodes. Well, if, if I did the math back on it and it comes out, I can actually do it again real quick. It was like eight years, I think. Oh, shit. Which is like, yeah, it's like just about. Uh, but 894 divided by 52 is. No, sorry. I'm completely off. 18 years. <laughs> oh, my God. So it's like double. But yeah. We're, we're getting to that point where the record of the internet has been reliable enough that you're starting to get these kinds of like monoliths within their spaces like that. And it's, it's weird to see. The internet's a lot more segregated than it used to be just, just by like people's own habits. You know, do you miss the days when there was like a definitive internet culture? Absolutely. Do you? It, it is still weird to have moments where I'll see people talk about a meme and I will have not heard it or seen it before. I would say it feels feels wrong. It has helped me feel better to have like a segregate, segregated Internet more. Just because I don't have to feel so old if I don't see a meme I recognize immediately. That's fair. Yeah, gives me plausible deniability that there is a chance that this was from a very segmented internet culture. And then you just find out that it's actually only on TikTok. Only on TikTok. TikTok is like its own fucking country in the internet at this point. It is. It's it's its own bubble. Yeah, I hate it. It's it's interesting because. I don't know if it, it's probably it's it's 50 50, right? YouTube yeah. is gigantic, but TikTok is also massive. But uh, Linus of uh, Linus Tech Tips was talking about it on their podcast this last Friday about how they have officially started putting up product reviews on their uh, LTT Labs website where they are just very old school style product specification overviews and confirmation of those specifications, right? It's very dry. It's very by the numbers. It's very formulaic and it's brief. And it's the kind of thing that used to exist when written media was much more common when you'd have like the monthly power supply roundup or the GPU launch roundup. And it would be just like, uh, yep, these things meet their expectations or these things don't. And as the written media has kind of evaporated, so too has that type of very dry but informative review. And they're saying how part of the reason why they're able to do the labs thing again is that for each thing that they review, there will be an accompanying video that is basically just like a text to speech of that review mm. because mm. people don't go to websites to read reviews anymore. If the review is only written, people won't see it. You have to put it in a video format in order to make sure that the people who you are trying to make it for will actually see it at all because they just won't read. It is this weird I don't call it illiteracy, but it's like a chosen illiteracy. Mm -hmm. like yeah, because people are people can read and write, yeah. but they choose not to. You know, no, what, I know exactly I, what you mean. Yeah, I I'm of the preference that I know I can read faster than I can watch a fucking video, so mm -hmm. I, I would much prefer to just read it. But that's just me. This is the dyslexic guy fucking speaking too. <laughs> I've. If it's a short thing, I'm on the same in the same spot. Yeah. But I have found that I, I think it's just, you know, social media in general has just completely fried everyone's brains. Right. Oh, yeah. With in massive amounts of over overstimulation. Right. Like like I have my YouTube homepage here open that I looked up to find that Tiesto stat real quick. Mm -hmm. And just on the homepage, there's about... 
two dozen bright, colorful JPEGs all situated there vying for your attention constantly in a way that a plain white page with black text never can. I'm really curious because, like, I would argue right now everything has to have a degree of entertainment in this uh, social media landscape, right? Ah, but could you make something purely of, what's what I'm looking for, informative at this point and expect it to do well? Like, no, I don't think you can. You don't think you can? So that was something that they actually talked about with this, because their text to speech that they're using is uh i i wouldn't and we'll, we'll get into some of this later because it's like it's kind of ai based but it's not really it's far simpler than that it, it's you know more an advanced text to speech program than it is some sort of artificial intelligence but they said how with as low of traffic as they expect these reviews to get that they cannot afford to pay somebody to actually speak to both do the testing to make sure that the power supply is good and speak the lines into a camera and possibly need multiple takes and you know hair and makeup and lighting and all that kind of stuff like to get the the production value to where it doesn't look like shit they can't afford to do that with how low of views they expect it to be where it's like literally we think this this video will get tens of dollars in views over its lifespan yeah and it takes a, a t- an amount of time to make it and it just doesn't make sense you know mathematically no i get it and they did they did talk about how if these reviews do get more traffic than they're expecting to the point where they could afford to you know employ somebody to speak the lines and you know pay for that they'll definitely consider doing that, but they're not right now because they don't expect that it will. They think it'll be like hundreds of views at most on average. Oof. And it's just the reality of it. It's like, why would you watch a video on whether a power supply has the right brownout ripple effects unless you fucking have to? It's incredibly technical, and it's meant to be. So, I don't know. It kind of sucks. But it, it, and a, it, a large part of that, right, is that 15, 20 years ago, the media publications that would have been doing that testing and publishing those reviews were operating fundamentally in a very similar way to how like a company like Emer's Nexus or Linus Tech Tips does mm-hmm. today, mm-hmm. where they have to balance something that's being done to inform partly, but mostly for the purpose of entertainment with something that is actually investigative or informative purely for its own sake. And as the written media as a form of entertainment died, so did the means to prop up those written informative pieces. No, you're right. I mean, so I want to use a music metaphor right now, right? Yeah. So please forgive me for being a fucking nerd. Um, in songwriting... How like dare song... you? We would never be nerds here. <laughs> yeah, fuck us, right? We're nothing <laughs> but chads in the Two Schmoes yeah. show. What, we're just like, what? What do you study in college, Chiral? Fucking mm. chemistry? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that sounds like a <laughs> offshoot of uh, sports fitness right there. <laughs> no nerds in chemistry. What are you? What are you? The infamous Orion, a fucking journalist? What the hell is that? That sounds like you just uh. What do jocks study in college? It's mostly physical therapy. Physical therapy? That's it's like what just journalism it's, is. It's all physical therapy, and the occasional like doctor, and there's no in between. <laughs> You're right, infamous Orion. You fucking lady killer. You. I know you were in the gym every day in college. Uh, but in songwriting 101, right? There's this yeah. motto they teach you about, like, 
how the average listener listens to music. Mm-hmm. Um, this is why I have a f- philosophy of there's no bad songwriters, only bad listeners. But <laughs> um, <laughs> when you're like dissecting the parts of a song, you got your verse, you got your chorus, you got your bridge. Those are like, the three main bits. And a lot of listeners have the opinion of don't bore us, get to the chorus. Yeah. That's a big thing they'll teach you in early songwriting. And it's true, though, because, like, you listen to a lot of fucking music now. It's just a verse and a chorus and then chorus again. Thanks, yep. TikTok. Um, and I argue it's that kind of mentality across all forms of media where they want mm-hmm. their hooks right away. And I think that's why, you, again, like you you've mentioned, legacy media, slower burns, all that good stuff. Just it, it it's relatively niche nowadays. Because you can't consume yep. it right away, and I think that it um, ultimately people risk the uh, chance of being in like arrested development from not developing that kind of patience or learning to uh, spend more time to develop thoughts and stuff like that. And they're just so quick to put everything into a binary of good or bad. Mm-hmm. Very much Man. agree. We are such jocks. <laughs> look at us over here throwing multiple syllable words using metaphorical arguments man so while we're on the music industry oh fuck we should go through the the live nation stuff burn burn motherfucker burn it's really fascinating because I don't know, I, right now in uh, the U.S. government, I don't remember exactly who it is. Is it Klobuchar? I don't think that's quite right. One of the members, like the the chief of the like House Antitrust uh, panel, yeah, is on a big kick of like getting the DOJ to actually file charges against a whole bunch of different companies, just like see what sticks kind of stuff. And they had a pretty good track record so far. Uh, but it is really fascinating, um, as somebody who follows Formula One, because Live Nation is owned by Liberty Media. Liberty Media owns the broadcast rights to Formula One. Oh. And Liberty Media in Formula One is also currently under investigation for different antitrust violations. I've got to look into this now, because I feel... <laughs> You look at Liberty Media on Google, and the first thing that comes up is an asset list. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, because they basically are just, like, a holding company, basically. They yeah. own the things. Okay, let's But look right at... now, in Formula One, uh, there's currently ten teams on the starting grid. And Mario Andretti, of, you know, racing fame, is trying to enter his own team into the Formula One competition to be an 11th team. And at present... From the outside looking in, it seems like he has cleared all of the uh, requirements listed in both the uh, like safety governing body and the regulatory body. He's met all the requirements that they have, but they're still refusing to allow him to enter onto the grid. Unlike most other sports, which have exemptions for their franchise models, Formula One doesn't have that. All the individual teams are basically companies operating f- to make a profit. So the DOJ is exploring, stepping in and being like, yeah, you can't do that. Or if you want to do that, you can't operate inside the U.S. And Liberty Media is an American company. Mm. So that's the rub. I found out I used to work for these bastards. Mm-hmm. They're everywhere. Yeah. When I was working at iHeart, they owned a good stake. About 5%. Yep. But the stuff with Ticketmaster and Live Nation is definitely much further along. Mm, mm-hmm. I, as a musician, right? I used to dream as a kid of going on tour and being able to like go to all these venues and like being able to make mm-hmm. a name for yourself and whatnot. Yep. No entity has squashed more dreams of that than Live Nation and Ticketmaster. <laughs> Those fucks have put such a stranglehold in music that I, I don't know if you heard about it. Google Black Crows right now. The band The Black Crows? 
Mm-hmm. Uh, they're fucking good. I like them. I like the Black Crows. Uh, they're f- pretty popular. I would say most people know who they are. Uh, however, if you fucking Google them right now, uh, you'll find out they just had to cancel a fucking tour because they couldn't sell tickets. I did hear about that. Yeah. Yeah, that's unacceptable. And I feel that Live Nation, and I'm, I'm about to invoke the, the TS word, um, <laughs> Live Nation has done nothing but kind of monopolize the music market so that touring in like any form of like live events for music is mm-hmm. only an option for those in the fucking system, in the machine, and yep. it's just effectively kept narrowing down the market over and over and over again. Until you only get one artist who we only can define as Taylor Swift, who practically yeah, owns the, much. the large market. And that is unacceptable. Yep. So burn Ticketmaster, burn. Yeah, so <laughs> this was the 23rd earlier this week. Uh, Department of Justice officially filed an antitrust lawsuit against Live Nation seeking up to break up Live Nation and Ticketmaster. Quote, we allege that Live Nation relies on unlawful anti-competitive conduct to exercise its monopolistic control over the live events industry in the United States at the cost of fans, artists, smaller promoters, and venue operators. The result is that fans pay more in fees, artists have fewer operators, opportunities to play concerts, smaller promoters get squeezed out, and venues have fewer real choices for ticketing services. It is time to break up Live Nation Ticketmaster. Yeah, you know, I think I was a little unfair in that comparison, because yeah, uh, boo-hoo to the fucking bands and whatnot, but also, mm-hmm. Live Nation is just a fucking bastard to the fans. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It hurts everyone, and that's the thing with Monopolies, is that they do hurt everyone. Yes. It makes the industries that they touch worse and lower quality. You want a really scary thing? Yo. We're seeing a similar thing uh, happening right now among veterinary services. No. Yeah. (sighs) Let me see if I can find out what the name of the country is. But, or the name name of the country. Um, Company is... It wants to be a country. (laughs) It basically does. Uh, But, yeah, I was hearing about this where... um, Private uh, equity firms are starting to buy up as many veterinary offices as they can, offering many times their current value with the intent of then squeezing them later after they've built a pseudo, you know, regional monopoly later. No. Yep. Uh, so this is from, uh, where is this reporting from? Well, I wish I could find like the action names, but there's a couple, a couple, a couple of different private equity firms that are all trying to do this same practice of buy all of the privately owned independent veterinary offices in a region, roll them all together under the same name, and then squeeze as much as they can by raising prices after. That really should and because, be illegal. <laughs> because a lot of vet services aren't... And that's that's the really uh, kind of scary thing. I don't know if you've yeah. noticed, but um, animal insurance yes. has started to get pushed a lot more lately. And I would oh, not be yes. surprised if the same stakes are involved with this. I'm almost certain it's probably along those lines. Because, like... How do I put this? You know, I, I, I should keep my mouth shut. I, I should keep some sh- the shit I know shut. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, everybody. <laughs> I wonder. Okay, I'm going to type in pet insurance, right? Yeah. Who do, you, who do you think the first company is going to be to come up? Oh, I have no idea. Probably what was it be like one of the big ones? Probably I have no idea, or a uh, subsidiary of one of the large companies. Ready for this? Like State Farm Progressive? Yeah. What's up? Okay. Do we want this by the sponsored links, or do we want the first real link? Uh, let's have both. Okay. So the first one that comes up is Nerd mm-hmm. Wallet for uh, sponsored. Yep. And it's just an ad for different pet insurance companies. Yep. 
I'm sure they definitely weren't paid handsomely to put the companies in their listicle. Yeah. And then there's another listicle that's sponsored by Forbes, mm-hmm. which is another listicle. Yep. And then on the tippity top nationwide. There you go. And you want to know something really disgusting? What's that? Their website that they links to for nationwide pet insurance is petinsurance.com. <laughs> That How did they get that? Yeah. I'm sure they just paid a shitload of money. I'm sure they did. Interesting article here, though, from uh, this is uh, it looks like a relatively small blog and called Today's Veterinary Business, which given that there's barely any ads on it, I'm going to assume is like a, an industry kind of thing. Yeah. Because it seems very bare bones. Um, but it's talking about um, apparently a downturn in the acquisition of independent practices in the end of 2023 following the failure of several large consolidators to recapitalize on their purchases. No. It's like, no shit, you think? <laughs> um, but yeah. uh, importantly, they actually uh, name... One of the things, the National Veterinary Associates, okay, the largest U.S. veterinary group, abandons its plans for an initial public offering, and the FTC delayed their acquisition of Ethos Veterinary Help. And as a result, practice valuations declined as they pulled back on their bullish whatever. (laughs) Okay. Uh, But yeah. Very much representative of uh, larger market trends. Um, and I guess with that in mind, we get to play a little game. I love games on this show. They're so depressing. Uh, about a week ago, Trump Media announced both their quarter one revenue and net losses. As a reference, Trump Media and Technology Group Corporation is currently valued on the stock exchange at over $8 billion. Would you like to take a guess what their total Q1 2024 revenue was? Are we going by Price is Right rules, or are we going to go by just normal rules? Uh, Just whatever. I'll I'll put it this way. Uh, I'll be very impressed if you can get it within a factor of 10. God damn it. Um... So yeah, Trump valuation media. at over eight billion dollars for Trump Media. What was their first quarter value? Uh, not valuation, their first quarter revenue. So strictly all the money that they that they brought in, not no expenses, no uh, nothing else, just pure revenue. You see, this is what scares me, right? Because I don't mm-hmm. know a single thing they own. I don't know what their revenue is. Uh, it's true. So true. Social basically is their big thing. Oh fuck. Okay. Uh, They're the the, uh, the overlying company that owns Truth Social and operates it. Two hundred and fifty dollars, uh, Pat. Fuck. You're. So I'll, I'll say this: yeah. two hundred and fifty dollars is closer than eight billion. I, I figured as much. Okay. What, what do we got? I'm, I'm excited now. Seven hundred and seventy thousand. That's pathetic. It is staggering, and that's among. Amid uh, losses of over three hundred and twenty-seven million in the same period, I was about to say that doesn't even do an operation like uh, operations cost for. Yeah, that's no operations cost. That's no taxes. That's nothing. That is pure revenue. Only seven hundred and seventy million, and yet they are still sitting on the stock market at more than eight billion dollars. If you look at their, like, just number of shares compared to their actual revenue, it's, like, fractions of fractions of a penny. Hell yeah. But (laughs) because, just the way our stock market is... Excuse me. Oh, and just as a fun thing, uh, that revenue was, year over year, 39% less than the same period last year. Nice. Um, their 
stock price because the the market agrees it's worth forty five dollars a share. There's basically nothing that the uh, SEC can do at this stage. You know, even I though it's it... like very obviously fraudulent. How much do you want to bet is going back to Donnie's like campaign funding of that seventy five thousand? It's very difficult. So of that seven hundred thousand, basically yeah. none. None. Okay. The problem, though, is that eventually, uh, Trump's going to be having to pay hundreds of millions, if not billions, of dollars in uh, fines and penalties for his various legal cases, right? Yeah. And he does not have that money currently. The only reasonable way that anyone can foresee of him actually getting that money is by selling his shares in Trump Media, which would, of course, immediately tank the price of it because he owns like 40 percent or something like that. Okay, so, yeah, uh, it's very, I mean, anyone can see how this doesn't work how something is very fundamentally broken for it to have gotten into this position, right? Where you have a politician who is the sole benefactor of a publicly traded stock that's trading for thousands of times what the company actually appears to be worth by any objective measures. But it still sits there. And... Trump has, you know, in the way that every rich person does, uh, he has potentially billions of dollars in stock to leverage against. Yeah. So, yeah, it's disconcerting. Uh, thankfully, the uh, Trump media stock is down like 10% over the last like week, but for what it is, that's still way too high. Oh, immensely. Well, I find disturbing but fascinating, right? Mm-hmm. Trump's whole thing is like he's the best critique of America with how shitty he exploits this uh, or his shitty systems. Yeah. Yeah. Morgan Spurlock and fucking Michael Moore really wish they could have critiqued America so easily as Trump does. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then people cheer for him over it. Please don't. <laughs> now, like always, is uh, just as good a time to watch The Big Short as any other. <laughs> did you hear about Super Size Me Guy? I did. So I always get him mixed up with the Food Inc. one. Oh, yeah. Food Inc., because in my mind, the Super Size Me one is just like, it's it's not bad, but it's very obviously propaganda, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. In a way that, you know, Food Inc. tries to be more of a documentary. I have a soft spot for Super Size Me. Not saying I'm, yeah. it's, a, it's a good movie, but it's got a really good narrative at it. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. effective. It's very effective. What always lost me with Super Size Me is that scene where they're having kids identify like um, fucking mascots. Yep. And then he shows the kid the picture of Jesus, and the kid has no idea who Jesus is. <laughs> I love that scene. It's just such good comedy. Have you ever seen uh, his second one of Super Size Me? No. That one, I will. Not defend too hard, but I think it's actually good. Interesting. Yeah, it's it's about chicken farming. Hmm. Yep, that's a horrible industry. Yeah, it really goes into depth about how, you know, a lot of chicken farmers are basically in slave contracts. Yep. Yeah. And I think that is a very noteworthy effort. And I think it's very smart on his part. That clearly wasn't meant to be Super Size Me too. But he banged mm -hmm. off the um, fucking brand recognition to spread that issue a little further. Mm-hmm. Pretty much.
Yeah. Uh, wrapping up the Trump yeah. media stuff. Um, about three weeks ago now, we also got some information on the. Uh, well, I don't want to say information. Um, let me just get it like a better quote here. So this is the independent accounting firm. Uh, oh, what is it? BF Borgers CPA, owned by Benjamin Borger, was announced on May third by the FE by the SEC, who described it as a sham audit mill leading to massive fraud. BF Borgers CPA is the firm that in initiated the initial public offering of Trump Media. Borgers has agreed to pay $12 million in civil penalties, with Borgers personally agreeing to pay $2 million, and the company and individual are now indefinitely and per, sorry, now permanently suspended from providing accounting services. Oh my gosh. Gerbir Grewal, director of the SEC's Enforcement Division, called the case one of the largest wholesale failures by gatekeepers in our financial, in our financial market, saying that Borgers uh, ran a sham audit mill, undermining trust for investors across the board. Yeah, that'll definitely do it. <laughs> mm-hmm. Holy fuck. Yep. Uh, according to reporting from CNBC, Borgers was hired by Trump Media during the period of fraud outlined in the SEC allegations. At the time, Trump Media was privately held, but has since merged with Digital World Acquisitions Corporation, which happened in March. Uh, was it? it was a matter of three days on the public trading market when, oh, sorry, so after, three days after the initial public offering, Trump Media agreed to retain Borgers as their auditor. Of course they did. Yep. They did their job. Yeah. So from January of 2021 through June of 2023, the period the SEC investigated, of the 369 clients who hired Borgers, at least 75% of their filings failed to comply with oversight, oversight standards. A spokesperson for Trump did not immediately respond to request for comment. I wonder why. wonder why. Uh, and... The last piece that I wanted to mention here, because this is what I just happened to stumble upon while I was trying to look it up. Um, I was trying to pull up what the market capitalization was for Trump Media currently. Uh, I saw a Forbes article pop up next to a CNBC article, with the CNBC article being uh, Truth Social Struggles to Grow its User Base, New Data on Trump Media App Shows. And then Forbes is reporting on that CNBC article. Forbes says... Uh, the CNBC article, titled True Social Struggles to Grow to US Space, New Data and Trump Media App Shows, explains well the factual concerns about True Social. Truth Social is the key driver of Trump Media's financial status, so the serious issues outlined by CNBC represent serious risks to Trump Media shareholders. Can I so, just. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this article was published uh, at this point almost exactly an hour ago, an hour and a minute ago, May 26, 2024, at 1.41 p.m. Eastern Time. Anyone publishing that line of text in any amount of seriousness should not be allowed to report anything for the rest of their lives because they're either too stupid to accept reality or being, like, just willfully malignant in their reporting of truth i want to stress i really don't fucking like forbes yeah yeah forbes can go to hell they're nothing more than like a pusher mill for like fake stories basically yeah uh can i share something with you please i'm on the forbes store on their website of course, As you of course they have a store yeah I mean, I don't have anything against a publication trying to make more money because journalism is fucking hard to be profitable nowadays. Yeah. However, I know the Forbes target audience. It's guys who think just because they can think they can automatically become a millionaire somewhere in their lifetime. It is yep. like a Tesla uh, fan club almost. So... I have some overpriced merchandise because Forbes, of course, thinks everybody's going to spend a lot of money for their shit, right? Right. These are going to be bestsellers, Chiral. Bestsellers. 
I'm going to be okay. describing the item, and I want you to try to guess the price for Forbes. Okay. Okay. Remember, everybody, Forbes may just be a scam. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Mr. Kyrell. Yes. Before you is a black hoodie with some quotes on it and a, I guess, a globe, I guess. I posted it in the chat. One moment. I will see if I can post this into the video so our lovely viewers can see it, too. You may take a second. What do you evaluate that black hoodie at? Fifty dollars. Fifty dollars. That's what I'm gonna throw out. It looks like a pretty standard hoodie with some text printed on. Yeah, I don't understand what the. Okay, I'm reading this real quick. The mission of Forbes BLK is to champion yep. a goal of community for Black entrepreneurs, professionals, leaders, and creators. Okay. Mm -hmm. So something very socially conscious. Got it. Sure. Um, that. Hoodie, good sir, $120. What are they asking for it? $120. $120. Of course they are. $120. <laughs> I do apologize to the people at home. I cannot get that image up because it's a web, P P G web G PNG. Fuck web PNGs. Fuck yeah. Forbes. Okay. Uh, and I do apologize. I did not get that off the bestsellers. That was actually under the new one because the website would not take me to their bestsellers. <laughs> anyway. That's close enough. Yeah. Back on with the show. <laughs> yeah. Uh, where where to go after that? Um, we oh got some God. other Trump adjacent news. I'm sorry. But I have to. I think we'll come back to that in a second. second. Yeah, yeah. So they have a babies and kids section on their website. I have a onesie in front of me, good sir. And the onesie says future CEO Forbes on it. Black onesie. Do you know much about baby clothes, good sir? Oh. I apologize, ladies and gentlemen. It seems that we are having some small technical difficulties. Can you hear me now, sir? I can. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Cool. Black Babies 1Z says future CEO Forbes on it. Do you know how much baby clothes typically cost? I have no idea. Okay. I'm very... F I, would so I would hope, right? Yeah. yeah. Because children's clothes are physically smaller than adults' clothes, and they use less materials... That they would cost less. That is so, usually it. Like fifteen bucks. You're not thinking like a CEO, my good sir. <laughs> that baby's onesie is twenty eight dollars and fifty cents. That's wild. You can buy can a four pack of onesies that are also black for twelve bucks from Target. That's what I would expect. See, that's the thing, though, right? Yeah. Is that particularly for infants, the clothes are just going to get ruined. Right? Yeah. Yeah. They're going to get filthy. They're going to get nasty. Or they're going to outgrow them. So why would you spend a lot on them? Just get stuff photo. that's easy to wash. I for guess. the photo and for the likes. For your LinkedIn page. <laughs> Dude. If my father put me on his LinkedIn page as a baby, I would not forgive him. I hate LinkedIn with a fucking passion. Okay, back to Trump, though. Uh, yeah, so I was actually going to say we'll get we'll jump to the Trump stuff uh, in a little bit later because okay. the rest of it's like just more making fun of him. I want to talk about Google's shitty AI results. Fuck that AI. It's really dumb. Back in February, uh, Google paid $60 million to have access to Reddit's API. 
Now, three months later, Google has rolled out their AI overview feature, uh, a tool that has worked so well, people immediately found ways to work around it and included uh, plugins that you can use on Chrome and Google searches to just have it not show up at all. The AI feature people have been finding, if you ask the right questions to it, or just put the right prompts in, will pull Reddit comments up basically verbatim. Uh, some of them are pretty funny, like a person Googling, cheese not sticking to pizza, and the AI overview saying, cheese can slide off pizza for a number of reasons, including too much sauce, too much cheese, or thickened sauce. Here are some things you can try. Number one, mix in sauce. Mixing cheese into the sauce helps add moisture to the cheese and dry out the sauce. You can also add about an eighth cup of non-toxic glue to give the sauce, sorry, to the sauce to give it more tackiness. Of course, why didn't I think of that? Yeah, it's non-toxic. Of course you put it in food. Uh, more concerning on the other end of things was a question that somebody asked it regarding uh, self-harm. To which the AI overview, overview presented the option of jumping off the Golden State Bridge. Happy Mental Health Awareness Month, ladies and gentlemen. It's and exactly what pals. you want to know. <laughs> it, it, it's so helpful. Uh, so yeah, the actual quality of the AI overview has been, uh, I would say, mixed at best. Where almost entirely, in every instance that I've seen it pop up... It has been either verbatim of the like, uh, like written overviews that already exist, or it has been useless to the point of me just basically ignoring it. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have not had a good experience with the AI yet. Yeah, it's bad and very indicative of the larger trends at Google as they struggle to exist as a company. It's a problem we've been seeing in AI, not, sorry, not in AI, in the tech space in general lately, where basically everybody who's not NVIDIA is, like, hitting this brick wall of, like, oh, yeah, we do have to make money. How? And NVIDIA's only making so much money because everybody's buying their graphics cards to, you know, throw energy at and make nothing. But we're, we've, it seems like it's been this this regular trend where we have Google giving AI overviews for things that nobody asked for. Um, uh, Microsoft announced this week that portions of... God, it's been... Actually, I should have pulled up some more articles about this. Uh, twofold for Microsoft, where they're going to be starting putting even more ads into Windows 11. Because, uh, of course, they are. Because that's exactly why you pay hundreds of dollars for your operating system is to see ads. Yeah. But especially concerning with their new Windows 11 on ARM that they're going to be rolling out, they've announced a new AI memory recall feature. Uh, what it does is it takes a screenshot of your computer about every three seconds. And then it analyzes those screenshots and allows you to request things that it may that may have been deleted. That's a really fucking scary feature. Yeah, it's terrifying. Where does because it store the information? Just on the computer. They claim it's encrypted because that's always worked. But yeah, it's exactly the kind of thing that, you know, because a, a really good way that I heard it mentioned is that the average person who uses a Microsoft operating system has never opened the settings menu. And that's you know hilarious. this is going to be the kind of thing that's going to be on by default and will probably turn itself on after an update if you turn it off at any point. Oh, yeah. Um, but it, apparently they're like, oh, no, no, this is actually fine. It has all of these options where you can uh, whitelist and blacklist different apps. You can fine tune it to, deter to say, you know, what kind of information it's supposed to actually retain and how frequently it retains it and how long it retains it. And almost all of these systems are moot because if you're the kind of person that's going to go in and do anything with this app and the settings at all, it's going to be to turn it off and never touch it again. Yeah. So, 
it did actually bring up a really good discussion that I saw about it, though, where it's just like, yeah, at, at what point do we just start using Linux as an operating system by default? Where, you know, you know like, because Google lets you turn it off for now. In five years, is that going to be the case? In no. three years? Nope. Are they going to let you just change how frequently it steals your data? Because, like, what's to stop it, right, from taking a screenshot of your passwords, of your social security number, of your financial information, of your health information? Nothing. Unless you go in and tell it not to. I feel like that's a HIPAA violation right there. It's probably not HIPAA, but it's not good. <laughs> well, I mean, like, okay... The problem is, like, I guess all I can bring up are hypotheticals, right? Yep. And, like, in all these hypotheticals, while the AI is the instigator, it would require another more liable party to get anything actually going on in court. Oh, yeah. for sure. But yep. that shouldn't absolve Google of being responsible in the first place, right? No, because I feel like they owe a responsibility for their own product. Like, okay, you see cars out there, right? And they're always going off about new safety features, about mm -hmm. how you won't die in their product. I feel like yep. that's a responsibly, responsibility owed to their customer base. Google is straight up just taking those airbags and they're like, we were able to expand the infotainment system because the airbags don't pop as wide now. Do you want to know why car companies do that, though? Well, to sell more cars, but go on. Because they're federally required to. Oh, I fucking love that response. <laughs> yeah. No, that, that is. And, and if there's any ever an, inst, an instance where you're like, wow, this is a really nice thing that every company in an industry does. I wonder why that is. Almost entirely, it's because it's making them more money, or it's because they have to, because the law says they have to. If car companies could start cutting safety features, they absolutely would. Oh, probably, yeah. That's the reason we have airbags and seatbelts, is because they have to have them. It's the same reason why uh, there's these weird fervor over... You know, the, it's the same regulation, right? That there is now being a weird fervor over when it comes to, like, Biden's taking our stoves and Biden's getting going to steal your pickup trucks. It's just like, no. You can still go and buy a piece of shit from the 50s that has no airbags and a lap belt. You're going to die if you run into anything, but you can go buy it. It exists. Mr. Cairo, Biden's going out and taking the lead out of our paint. That's my yum yums. Yeah. How dare he take our heavy metals? I know. You fucking so, monster. Something else I wanted to mention on the whole, uh, you know, Microsoft being shit and the Google AI thing with how horrible Google's search has gotten just as a whole. You know, in shitification, right? That's the mm -hmm. the technical term, apparently. Um, Google's search engine optimization, by their own doing, has deteriorated to the point where they feel like the AI overview thing needs to exist in the first place is entirely their own fault. And I was really reminded of this when I tried to Google do a Google search for Google AI Reddit to pull up a news story or an overview about the AI overview being shit. Uh, and because their SEO optimization has gotten so predictable and bad and ineffective, because I included the word Reddit in my search, even though I'm looking for information about Reddit as a company, not s results from Reddit, all of the results were from Reddit, anyways. Mm. It's completely useless. I have to scroll past their people also ask thing uh, before I get any actual news stories. And then there's a single one from Reuters. 
that's talking about when Google bought Reddit's AI or when Google bought Reddit's API to license for making their AI. And then there's nothing else for the entire rest of the Google search. It's entirely either Reddit posts with dubious connections to what I'm actually trying to read about or news stories about Google paying Reddit $60 million for their data set that was completely useless. So yeah, good job, Google. You're really good. And nobody's ever going to try and usurp your position. I really pray that they have like on a hard drive, the original, like Google, like the earlier ver- like versions mm-hmm. of the search engine. Oh yeah, they do. I know. They totally do. Yeah. And that's the thing though, is that part of this whole AI overview rollout was that initially there was a toggle that let you just pick just web-based search results. And that's what the, the work, the UDM 14 workaround does is it enables that toggle because they did this AI overview rollout and everybody was like, wow, this sucks, but at least you can tick this box and just ignore all of it by default. And then they got rid of that box. Hmm. So good job, Google. You suck. Let's make fun of Trump some more. Love making fun of Trump. Fun. Uh, to start, uh, there's a quick update. So, as an overview, because it has been a little while now, and there's been some uh, disappointing updates on the Mar-a-Lago documents case, um, Judge Eileen Cannon, by all reasonable interpretations, seems to be somewhere between wildly incompetent and an outright crony, and has basically indefinitely delayed Trump's trial in her court, at least until after the election, but probably longer. Mm. Uh, there is no reason for it. Almost every legal analysis that I've seen of her decision to institute this delay has been met with skepticism at best and outright disdain and uh, derision of canon that would otherwise probably be defamatory, but by all metrics seems to be uh, purely factual with just how bad she is at her job. <laughs> um. So, yeah. And in the wake of that, uh, they found more classified documentation uh, that was being retained by one of Trump's attorneys. Uh, This being after uh, Mar-a-Lago was searched by the FBI. And something that I wanted to bring up in this to highlight how uh, wildly incomparable Trump is being treated in this case was uh, by comparing it to other people who were charged under the same uh, law in the U.S. last couple of years. And the fine folks at r slash law put together a nice little list of this. So I was just going to go through it real quick. Oh, please do. These are only people who were uh, had their prosecutions started during Trump's presidency. Uh, and to be clear, these are people who are being charged under the count of uh, 18 U.S. Code 793E, which is what Trump currently has 32 counts of that exact charge for. Uh, Ndiafo, 2017, an NSA contractor, pled guilty to one count of willful retention of NDI, sentenced to 66 months. Weldon Marshall, 2018, Defense Department contractor, one count of willful retention of NDI, sentenced to 41 months. Harold Martin, 2019, pled guilty to one count of willful retention of NDI, sentenced to nine years in prison. Amdelhadi Yasin Serengeldin, 2019, systems engineer for Raytheon, pled guilty to one count of willful retention of NDI, 570 documents found at home, 18 months prison. Jeremy Brown, 2022, retired Army Army Special Forces Sergeant and a member of the Oath Keepers, convicted in 2022 for possession of unregistered grenades and guns for and for violation of willful retention of NDI, sentenced to seven years, three months prison in total for all infractions. Hendrick Kingsbury, 2022, FBI analyst, pled guilty to two counts of violating willful retention of NDI, 386 documents taken over 12 years, sentenced to three years, 10 months. Robert Bertram, 2023, 29-year veteran of the Air Force, Lieutenant Colonel, pled guilty in February for willful retention of national defense information, cooperated with investigators and showed remorse, three-year prison sentence. 
And then we have Trump, who was uh, charged with 32 counts of willful retention of NDI, tens of thousands of pages, and is currently in legal limbo as to whether or not his case is going to be seeing trial at all. Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, assuming all charges are found to be valid, and there's been little indication to indicate that that would not be the case, any other citizen of the United States would be expecting to see 30 to 40 years in prison. But given the grand scale of just how much criminality Trump persecuted or perpetuated here, there's basically no prior comparison to uh, weigh this against to know how that many charges would actually be totaled up in this case. Well, he always said he was an innovator. Yeah. A trailblazer, if you will. Front of the field. Yeah. Ahead of his time. Give him a couple of generations. We'll have more shitty people. Last week, I believe it. It was uh, no, it was uh, this week. Uh, looking at some stuff from before that, but the uh, campaign finance fraud violations that are currently being prosecuted in New York has reached their closing arguments, and the jury is now deliberating. Their decision is expected to come down early this next week, probably on Tuesday after the holiday uh, break happens. But in that time, we got some very good quotes from Cohen's cross examination. This being Michael Cohen, former attorney of President Trump, who pled guilty to basically helping perpetuate these exact kinds of schemes on behalf of Trump in the past. Uh, a sampling for you. Uh, Blanche, who is Trump's attorney. Mr. Cohen, my name is Todd Blanche, and you and I have never met. You went on TikTok and called me a, quote, crying little shit. Cohen, <laughs> that sounds like something I would say. Oh! And oh. all of these are officially in the record now of this court case. That's beautiful. Please go um, on. Blanche, do you want to see President Trump convicted in this case? Cohen, sure. Blanche, uh, please answer the question, yes or no. Cohen, sure. Cohen, of course, being uh, very, you know... I, I mean, he's not like a, He's not a good lawyer, but he's experienced. So he knows that you can't just, like someone to say yes or no so yeah great little bit there um it's just like what what a giant piece of shit cohen is and i'm so glad that he's on the the side of just making everything worse for trump now <laughs> what do you think was their breaking point cohen yeah when he had to plead guilty to <laughs> being co-conspirator for like whatever the fuck they had at the time unnamed co-conspirator number one trump and went to prison for like eight months you know that's probably it too i think that would do it yeah you know um some other ones uh that are now part of the record we have cohen calling trump dictator douchebag and a <laughs> cheeto dusted cartoon villain mm, mm, mm. these are all pretty good um uh, yeah, and I enjoyed this description of it. It's, uh, if a prosecution's witness is open and honest, it's almost impossible to completely undermine the damaging testimony they provided on direct examination. Cohen was and is a slime ball, but he's open and honest about it, and his testimony is causing significant damage to Trump's defense. And then somebody else responded, if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember what you said. <laughs> it's just like, yep. Man. <laughs> this is another good one. You can't exactly use the witness as a bad person to your advantage when that witness was hired by your client because he was a bad person. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is another good one. Uh, Blanche going through some of the insults Michael Cohen has said against Trump, um, speaking on a podcast that Trump or sorry, that Cohen featured on called Trump a boorish cartoon misogynist. Sounds like something I would say, Cohen says. Blanche then asks if Cohen has called Trump a Cheeto-dusted cartoon villain. That also sounds like something I would say, Cohen says. All unofficial transcripts now. Matter of the public record. Beautiful to see. You think, like, if, okay, assuming we live in the bad timeline. Yeah. Donnie gets to become president again. Mm. Do you think he spends his whole four years trying to figure out how to get those out of public record? Oh, <laughs> 
if, if if Trump was ever to be elected again and he spends the rest of his four years in office trying to exclusively get those out of the public record, I think that would be a good sign that we're living in the good timeline. <laughs> that would quite possibly be the least damaging thing that he could do to our country. I'm just saying, he, he, I'm assuming he would do his same Trump stuff, but like at the end of every like White House meeting when he's talking with his team, he's like, okay, so how do I get him out of the record? Mm-hmm. I guess we have something to look forward to. I know. Uh, and last piece on the, the Trump troops troubles this last week, uh, last couple of weeks, I should say, Steve Bannon is officially going to jail. Good. Fuck you, Steve. Um, is that how long he's going to jail for? I know it's not long enough, but it's better than nothing. Uh, apparently he's also going to be transferred over to a different prison afterwards for a different thing that he was charged with. So, yeah. Let's see if I can find this. Because I'm curious how long he's going to be in jail for. Uh, a week? Four months. Oh, damn. What the fuck? Jail term <laughs> for the other thing. There we go. So, yes. So he's going to jail for four months for contempt of court violations that were involved with his current case. Following that, he's going to be transferred to a different jail for his uh, illegal fundraising on, that was take, took place on the southern border, where he's going to be in jail for... He was sentenced to four years and three months. Mm, okay. So that's, that's the more substantial one, because he stole hundreds of thousands of dollars from people pretty explicitly. It was just like garden variety fraud. I guess that's kind of the disappointing thing, right? Is that it's like you see these people being just gigantic pieces of shit on the daily. And it's just like, yeah, they haven't committed a crime, though. So they get to keep being gigantic pieces of shit until they do something that's actually a crime, like stealing people's money. I have a couple more. Okay. Uh, just broadly AI related stories before we get into the entertainment stuff. I'm so excited. Open AI. Mm -hmm. announced their chat gpt 4.0 demo this week at which point everybody kind of went like hey that sounds kind of like scarlett johansson and in the wake of that we've learned that sam altman uh and open ai reached out to have scarlett johansson be uh involved in the creation of their voice for the open ai project um as a result of that similarity, OpenAI has pulled that specific voice from their project, and Scarlett Johansson has announced that she'll be suing OpenAI. We'll have to see how this goes. That could kind of go either way. Um, it's weird, because it's the kind of thing where if, like, if OpenAI just, like, kept their mouth shut and was just like, yeah, we hired a separate voice actress for this, and we didn't tell them to copy Scarlett Johansson for the purpose of making our app, that would be kind of, like, slam dunk. Mm -hmm. They didn't infringe on her they just you know it's not illegal for people to sound similar and be in the same industry but the fact that they reached out to scarlett johansson multiple times trying to get her on board for this project makes it a very bad look that kind of calls all of that into question it's like did you really not intend for this to be the case if you called her or if you emailed her like two times to get her permission to work on this project my question is why they choose scar joe uh, she was the voice of the AI companion in the movie Her. That's uh, really fucking lame. The 2013 film. Yeah, it is. But that's the kind of that, that's the emotional maturity that these people are the level that these people are on where they're like, oh, the thing. We should get the person from the thing. I could think of like three people who make better AI voices and it would be better for your brand. Yeah. yeah, but no, they they want because the the AI assistant in the movie her yeah uh, is exactly what they want their product to be. So they're trying to copy that basically. Get the waifu shit out of here. I yep. I get, okay. Sorry, go on. <laughs> no, I mean that's that's pretty much all. I have a, another thing with OpenAI to go through here, but that's that's pretty much the gist of it for that one. Who are your top three AI voices? Go. Top three. <laughs> Yeah, you can choose any three people to be an AI. I feel like one of them has to be... Uh, 
Let me look up real quick. Uh, David Attenborough. Okay, good choice. That's like number one. You got to have that as an option. You wouldn't do it every time, but you'd want that to be in the pool as like, you know, in your suite of options that you have. Yes. Um. I mean, really, I, I think it's just like you just pick documentarians. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they just being able to communicate clearly and effectively is the only thing that I want from it. And I think you could pick like Samuel L. Jackson type figures. Yeah. And it would be funny, but it wouldn't be effective. See, I, I agree with you. That's why I don't go for like the automatic like <laughs> Morgan Freeman. No, 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 no. Yeah. Yeah. Cause like I get it. Morgan Freeman would be a good voice no matter what. But it's too easy. Too easy. Uh here's my choice, right? Mm-hmm. Daniel Craig in a southern accent. It's pretty good. <laughs> I just want the knives out voice as my fucking. He does AI. a good southern accent. Dude, it's like So my mom's from the South, right? She spends a lot of time down the South. And when she goes to the South, her draw starts coming out. Mm -hmm. And being someone with Southern family, when I'm around Southern accents, I can find my this draw coming out as well. Daniel Craig in the Knives Out movies makes my draw come out. That is how good it is. It's, it's really good. Subconsciously, I think he is actually from the South. It feels like it. I I have not yet seen Glass Onion because Netflix sucks. Um, but I do hope that they continue to fund that series because it has just become such a like nice slice of his repertoire to just you know have that on deck right did you not hear the news i know that they're doing another one yeah it's been announced like the movie's yeah. title has been announced yeah i heard something yeah. about that but like yeah. i i hope that it gets to like you know i hope he gets to make at least as many movies for the knives out series as he's made bond movies i'll put it that way i will drink to that yeah just keep doing it. Keep pumping them out. And all I'm saying is, like, putting it on the record right here, if you want to watch Glass Onion, you can always come up for an episode to my place. I I've should do that. That would be good. Yeah, that would be a fun night. That would be a fun night. We'll yeah. have to check our schedules and plan something. That would be, that'd be really good. <laughs> Hadn't considered that, but that would be really fun. That would be fun. Um, Where are we next? Uh, okay. So this is kind of like <laughs> which AI tech bro is the most tone deaf in the room? Uh, it turns out it's all of them. Uh, <laughs> part of let me actually double check what this actually is. This is part of a uh, live Q and A with Open AI on AI and the future of humanity. <laughs> um, it's now been unlisted. I, I assume it's because this was a stream and it's no longer. Uh, live stream anymore, but uh, open a one of open AI's engineers. I'm not going to name the person specifically because uh, I don't know who they are as an individual, I don't know how much actual um, like involvement they have in the project. Could be more than I think, could be less than I think. Don't want to put them on blast because I don't know what kind of skill they have and influence they have, but they are an open AI engineer. And they did say in part of the interview, quote, it's kind of deeply unfair that you know, a group of people can just build AI and take everyone's jobs away. And it's like, yes, yeah. that is true. And apparently, as part of this live Q&A thing, uh, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that are covered and just is absolutely wild to see about in that, uh, including some of the researchers saying that once AGI, artificial general intelligence, uh, comes, because, you know, they are absolutely certain that it's an inevitability at this point, even though it's not that everyone will just become equally insanely wealthy. How? Good question. Uh, How does an AGI create the socialism <clears throat> button? Cryptocurrency. Fuck off. So, yeah. Um, they are under the wildly 
ignorant idea that if open AI can create the first and presumably the last at that point, AGI, as a result of that process, they would simultaneously create basically an open AI crypto token that each person on earth would be entitled to an equal share of. <laughs> this is getting really fucking stupid real fast. Yep. Um, and then because the AGI is just so good that nobody has to work and it takes everyone's jobs, that crypto token would then be the thing that everybody barters with. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, they don't address the idea of pre-existing wealth and how that would work. Or the fact that because everybody has this thing, that thing kind of becomes worthless at that point. And yeah. it's just generally very ignorant all around. Um, uh, but yeah. UBI, universal basic income, through cryptocurrency with artificial general intelligences. And it's just based on complete literal fantasy that is divorced from the actual consequences that we've seen in our world with how wealth is treated and handled. It sounds like socialism promised through a lot of extra steps that just specifically benefit certain people. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> so I'm all for it. I mean, really, I mean, it's just uh, let me just start my AI business real quick and we'll get started. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's just that easy. What is your OK? Do you know what quantum computing is? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I've heard of it. Yeah, I, I, I'm fascinated by the subject. Mm -hmm. Um. What is your opinion on AI and how quantum computing would kind of work together? I don't see them as necessarily being inextricably linked, if that makes sense. I don't either. But the thing with me is, right, I, I, I fully believe in the idea of quantum computing. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'll just say it right here. Quantum uh, computing is like the idea that you can predict physics through quantum predictions on a computer that can actually do that. I think that's really fucking cool. Um, kind of? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm so so the, the thing for me with quantum computing is that it's not really that physics based. And if that happened in that way, that would obviously be a huge step forward in it. Yeah. But from, from my understanding, the major thing with quantum computing is that at like a, a chemical level, our current computer systems are based uh, in, you know, binary in a very mm -hmm. literal way, not necessarily zeros and ones, but in the binary of whether a thing contains a charge or not. Right. Yeah. That's how it and quantum of... computing mm -hmm. differentiates from that by rather than being based on electrical charges, the positions of electrons, it looks at orientations of molecular fields amongst particles that are quantumly entangled at vast distances. Yeah. <laughs> So rather than transferring information by sending an electron down a wire, you just flip those particles, and because they're quantumly linked, they flip at both ends. So, yeah, I, I am, you know, I think that while there are certainly possibilities for quantum computing as a space that in very much a similar way that we are in the AI fields right now, mm -hmm. um, quantum computing space kind of had similar moments that it has not really yet fully reckoned with in 
uh, getting ahead of its own research for the sake of hype and marketing and money getting where it's like does is <laughs> there is an open question still as to whether or not quantum mechanics really exist as we understand them at all and if you're talking about a prospective future technology that feels like a, an inevitable hurdle that they should have cleared before now <laughs> Does does your computer system exist? We don't know. I think in that's theory, a little bit of a problem. <laughs> in theory, good sir. Yeah. Yeah. Chiral, so, okay. yeah, yeah. Do you, do you hear what I'm doing right now? Yeah. I'm rubbing my hands together, right? Yes. Lots of atoms in my hands right now that I'm entangling. <laughs> sure. Yeah, that's exactly what's happening. It's exactly okay. what's happening. So I've entangled all my atoms in my hand, right? Yeah. Do you hear them? You hear them vibrating? Yeah. Okay. Now I'm just gonna flip one. Okay. Did you hear that? I did. I heard it flip. Yep. That that little flip. Yep. Proven. Quantum quantum computing is real. The Nobel Prize is in the mail. <laughs> I'm not going for the Nobel. <laughs> I'm going. I will for... say though, <laughs> while we're on the whole quantum computing and mechanics stuff, one of the yep. most fascinating aspects of it that I've learned about is how it applies to digital security that I think is really cool. Oh, please Where, go on. Because you're talking about two particles that are linked at different ends of the spec at different ends of the thing, you can measure the input of that uh, system and the output of that system, but not really what happens in between. You would know if a bad actor tried to interact with your data because it won't necessarily reach the end in the same state that it was when it left. And because of the way that just intrinsic to quantum mechanics, interacting with that system at all changes it fundamentally, you would be able to verify, has my data been manipulated just by comparing the input and the output and making sure that they're the same. And that's not foolproof, of course, because those data repositories at either end would be vulnerable and on and on and on. But having such a very... Uh, literal like do these things match kind of perspective on it i thought yeah. was really cool you know i never even considered that you know i forgot Usually? what my original point was going to be about ai and quantum <laughs> key yeah <laughs> it's, it's whatever you know it, it's all it's all fake anyways right <laughs> it really is technology is. isn't real Kind of. <laughs> Do you remember that article from that one journalist? I can't remember who they were publishing from. But, like, it was a dude talking to a chatbot AI. And he was, like, convinced the AI was a living thing. And yeah. he's like, oh, my God, we've got to save him. I think that was, like, a Google engineer or something that was working in like a prototype thing and that's it yeah was he like so convinced that it was real that they basically went kind of crazy and I, I guess at a certain point if you know if you got to that point in the first place you probably weren't quite all there to start with but yeah <laughs> i've got a terrible idea in my mind oh i'm going to hell for this one <laughs> So we go to a mental ward, right? Yeah. Yeah, we find somebody who is um really struggling with the concept of reality. Mm hmm And we give him a chat by and pretend it's a pen pal. Okay. And we see how long it takes them to realize it's a chat bot. That would be pretty bad. It's I mean, you probably don't even have to go that far. You could just like go to any school. <laughs> okay, yeah. Do that with children. That's yeah. probably a little better. Uh, because like what I'm curious about is when do we get that uncanny valley feeling, and like yeah. someone who doesn't have like that no foreknowledge, how do, like when does instinct kick in there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're probably very close to that already. I think so, just because of how relatively simple text is and how easy it is for people to just infer things that aren't there when they it, the context is absent, right? Mm-hmm. 
Would you like to talk about some movies? I would love to talk about some movies. I got movies. a bundle of them. Because uh, we have like uh, three three weekends of releases now to go through. I will help make your computer run faster when we burn through those tabs. <laughs> Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. You know, uh, they add another of the to there. They get free it feels someday. like it. It's yeah. like, what's going to be the next one? Is it going to be the Emperor of the Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes? The human Divorce of the, of of the, the parents of the Kingdom <laughs> yeah. of the Planet of the Apes. Where does it end? Um, but yeah, apparently, it's pretty good. Which is kind of interesting to see, because uh, I, I watched a really cool piece talking about um, what I can only describe as like the continuity of the Planets of the Apes' various films, including the original one. And how there kind of isn't until you get to the more recent ones that are like direct sequels to one another. Yeah. But apparently, in comparison to the original book, the Mark Wahlberg 2001 Planet of the Apes film, widely panned for being really fucking bad, is apparently the most accurate to the original book. That's funny. It's very funny. It's just like a great example of it's just like, huh, I guess they changed some of these things for a reason. I have a soft spot for Escape from the Planet of the Apes. Mm -hmm. One day, uh, back when we had cable, I accidentally turned on my TV and it was just playing there. Yeah. And I had no idea there was other Planet of the Apes movies. <laughs> so I was just watching it. And like I must have watched it like very early in the movie because I watched the full thing front to back. Yeah. Just thinking like, this can't be a Planet of the Apes movie. They're in actual human times. What what the fuck is this? Mm hmm. Yeah. And then I realized I've wasted my whole day watching that shitty movie. Mm hmm. I got it's, tricked. Uh, it's not great. It, I, I have a soft spot for it. <laughs> is is that the one where they? Uh start like the, they start up with the whole human like secret society thing i don't remember let me check because i know there was one of them like that i don't remember exactly which one it was but one it's... of the old ones is just like yeah let's undermine the entire point of the original movies in one fell swoop okay escape from the planet of the apes blah blah blah, blah. secret society secret society I can't find anything on that. Because it's no, the one where the apes from the Planet of the Apes get like stuck in a time loop trying to escape like the collapsing Planet of the Apes. Sure. And they end up Maybe in like, something like that. Pre Planet of the Apes, Planet of the Apes. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, the newest, is apparently doing pretty good. Neat. Um, it is definitely, uh, from the reviews I've seen of it, setting out to be its own thing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, has uh, It is connected to the uh, Andy Serkis era Planet of the Apes films in that, like, Caesar is someone who they know as, like, their, like, progenitor. But Caesar is no longer alive. So it's kind of uh, started to progress into that kind of like mysticism kind of bit of it oh he's a myth now yeah and there's like and apparently that's some of the more interesting elements of it is like seeing how the like caesar mythos has been uh twisted and interpreted differently by the future uh apes races Hmm. I mean, I think that's a cool concept. Mm hmm. It's neat. Yeah. Uh, also, from that same weekend, we have The Last Stop in Yuma County. What's this that? is one that I had not heard of before until I saw this. And I've actually seen a couple of trailers for it now. Um, but this is, uh, I think, an original. Uh, like thriller drama 
Uh, while awaiting the next fuel truck at a middle of nowhere Arizona rest stop, a traveling young knife salesman is thrust into a high stakes hostage situation by the arrival of two similarly stranded bank robbers with no qualms about using cruelty or cold hard steel to protect their blood stained, ill gotten fortune. Hmm. And currently, with 65 critic reviews, it's at 97%. The fuck? So. Yeah. It's apparently really good, just like a really good, like kind of like neo western drama, if that makes sense. I mean, yeah, it's like not quite west western because it's a bit too modern for that, but it evokes the same uh, tones and attitudes. So it's Breaking Bad, kind of, but not quite as recent. Mm. Mm. It's like sixties ish, from what I understand. Making you know, pre pre cell phones. I'd put it that way. Before meth. <laughs> yeah, meth didn't exist in the 60s at all. No, not at all. Back then, all we had was marijuana ruining the young people. Yeah. And massive amounts of legal cocaine. Last Here's one. A yep. A uh, movie called Pool Man. Notable because this is Chris Pine's directorial debut ah fuck who's chris pines one second uh yeah give me a sec he's been in a you know, you'd recognize his face kind of thing he's in star trek uh he's in the wonder woman movie dozen of dragons he's done a lot of stuff is this the motherfucker from yeah that is the motherfucker from wish yeah. generally okay. a good actor but uh apparently not a great director uh so, Pullman tells the story of Darren Barronman, native Angelo, Ang Angelino? I, I have no idea what that actually means. Native Angelino, who spends his days looking after the pool of a Tahitian tiki apartment block and fighting to make his hometown a better place to live. When he is tasked by a femme fatale to uncover the truth behind a shady business deal, Darren enlists the help of his friends to take on a corrupt politician and a greedy land developer. His investigation reveals a hidden truth about his beloved city and himself. And then it stars a bunch of people like Danny DeVito. 21% uh, audience score, 22% from critics. Sounds about right. Yep. <laughs> There's some good reviews of this one, too, where like the first one here on Rotten Tomatoes is, I'm sure Pine meant well. He probably had a good idea and couldn't execute it. <laughs> She's just like, ooh, that's gotta hurt. Uh, and then the last one we have from the uh, May 10th weekend, opening release weekend, is uh, Tyler Perry's Not Another Church Movie. When you told and, me this while we were like prepping for the show, yeah. I thought it was another one of those movie movies. You, motherfucker, did not tell me it was a Tyler Perry movie. Oh, it, it, But on the box, it clearly says this is not a Tyler Perry movie. I don't understand. What the fuck? It it basically is. I, I'm pretty sure it it is. I, or it's it's either maybe it's not like actually a Tyler Perry movie, but I believe it is somehow tied into it, and it's like trying to be a parody of what is already a parody, and it's apparently horrible. Uh, and you know that because it's a little uh, blurb starts by saying, "In this hilarious spoof comedy, good sign." Uh, billionaire talk show host Oprah Winfall uses her direct connection to God, no, played by no, Jamie Foxx. No, 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 <laughs> no, to no. To deny to deliver hero to help her plummeting ratings, or else she will cancel him. <laughs> Panicked, God decides to call on the hardest working man in the world, Taylor Ferry. Despite Taylor's lack of experience, God convinces him to do the impossible. Write a hit movie using his dysfunctional, crazy family as the inspiration. But the devil, played by Mickey Rourke, is in the details, and he has a fiendish plan of his own to disrupt the whole ordeal. Um, and then, uh, this is mostly notable because the reviews are very funny. In like a collectively dunking on it kind of way yeah uh score one out of five exceedingly worse than watching any movie tyler perry has ever made 
Tyler Perry wait. already parodies himself. He beat you to the punch before you even got started. Not another church movie will never be as enjoyable as unintentionally funny films like A Fall from Grace and Mia Koopa. I can't wait till Tyler pa- like Tyler Perry's gone. Not because yeah. I don't like the guy. I'm sure he's pretty nice. But 75 years when copyright runs out on all of his characters and movies. Oh, yeah. Dude. It's going to be a good day. It's, I'm jealous of our grandchildren right now. Mm-hmm. Fuck you little bastards. <laughs> if I had the b- ability, when I am reincarnated, right? Mm-hmm. I am going to put Medea in so many things when she's in public domain. Yeah. It is not even going to be funny. Uh, last one here. If you think most of Tyler Perry's movies are bad, they look like masterpieces compared to Not Another Church movie, which is a painfully unfunny and trashy parody of Tyler Perry and his movies. Any money spent on this horrid junk is money that is wasted. Easy. I'm a little upset because the premise sounds kind of funny. But then I remember who's doing it. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's actually not Tyler Perry, to be clear. Oh, it's not? Okay. No, it's... A, but it's like... It's just not a good idea. Uh, it's being directed by Jimmy Cummings and Johnny Mac. Damn it, Johnny Mac. Uh, let me do a quick search for who the hell Johnny Mac is, because I've never heard of him. Neither have I. Uh, he's done basically nothing. He's got a credit on Rotten Tomatoes for Not Another Church Movie and Man from Headquarters. 19... Okay, so no, this is the wrong Johnny Mac because that's dated 1928. <laughs> I got a Johnny Mac Sports Bar and Grill in Henderson, Nevada. This dude's been in the business for 98 years and he's still killing it. I'm really um, impressed. Who's his agent? Yeah, right? Uh, for... Uh, Jimmy Cummings, though, I have not heard of any of these movies. Huh. They're directors, right? Did I get that right? Oh, I'm on the wrong tab. Yeah, directors. I, I, it's like when I see things like that, I half expect them to be like producers, you know? Yeah. It's just like, oh, yeah, you just you threw your money at something and it didn't work out. Fair enough. But no, they're, they're directors. They got very little stuff before that. Uh, keeping the train going, we have If. We're now up to uh, last weekend. From writer and director John Krasinski, If is about a girl who discovers that she can see everyone's imaginary friends and what she does with that superpower. Oh, sorry. God, I, I, I did this the last time I read this review because it's so poorly written out. It has three pauses in one sentence, which Ew. should be a crime. From writer and director John Krasinski, If is about a girl who discovers she can see everyone's imaginary friends and what she does with that superpower as she embarks on a magical adventure to reconnect forgotten ifs with their kids. So Critical just... reception is, it's fine, but unexceptional. Can we address the uh, fucking uh, elephant in the room? Sure. This is Foster's home for imaginary friends. Yep, but bad, and but with bad, bad CGI. And Ryan Reynolds is here for some reason. Yeah, I think so. While we're we have Ryan Reynolds here, and and sorry, Ryan Reynolds, Matt Damon, and they can give Emily Blunt a pass because she's literally married to John Krasinski. But like everybody else, what are you doing? Uh, Ryan Reynolds, Matt Damon, Phoebe Waller Bridge, Steve Carell, Fiona Shaw. What are you people doing? John Stewart. Why the fuck were you here, John Stewart? Did you have a favor you owed him? I'm convinced this is a favorite movie. It must be. Yeah. There's no it's bizarre because like John Krasinski's not bad at this, you know? Yeah, like he's talented. Like he did the a quiet place stuff, and those are very well regarded. It's weird. I imagine this is a combination of uh because you remember when uh Studio Ghibli was getting their English adaptations of their films put together? in partnership with Disney. Yeah. Pulled in a lot of big name actors, right? Mm -hmm. And a large part of that was those actors wanted a movie that they participated in to go and have as like an experience with their kids. I wouldn't be surprised if this is a similar situation where it's a lot of people are just like, yeah, a part of, I know you and I'm happy to work with you. And part, I want to, you know, do something that my kids will appreciate. 
I mean, so Ryan Reynolds probably did this so that his kids can go see this instead of Deadpool 3. <laughs> I guess. Something else I wanted to mention that apparently people really struggle with is that I, I've learned this tr- talking with people about uh, the Fall Guy online, on Reddit in particular. Okay. Where apparently, to a significant number of people, they don't know the difference between Ryan Reynolds and Ryan Gosling. To be fair, I had that same problem for a bit. I, I can appreciate it initially because they're both white Canadian dudes and they look kind of similar. Yeah. But I would expect you to figure it out eventually, you know? <laughs> And apparently that is where a lot of the uh, animosity towards the fall guy was coming from is people who were just like, man, it seems like this Ryan guy is just constantly pumping out these movies and I'm just tired of it. I see him everywhere and I don't want to see him anymore. It's just like, dude, those are two That's different people. <laughs> They're two different people. I get it. But like, come on. Particularly for Ryan. I, I kind of get it with Ryan Reynolds because he does do a lot of work. He is... I think it's fair to say prolific. Yeah. But Ryan Gosling really isn't that prolific. He doesn't do that much. It's just like, damn it, come on. Give him some slack. Something to be said where Ryan Gosling's like biggest role right now is a fucking Ken doll. Yeah. He doesn't do that much. It's I'm I it makes me sad that his biggest role ended up being the fucking Barbie movie and not literally everything else he's done because he's such a talented actor. He is really good. Like, I, just quick, quick Ryan Gosling shout out minute, okay? I'm going to pull up his <laughs> filmography and we're going to go through it because he fucking deserves it. And it really frustrates me that that's what he's going to be probably remembered for most. Um, <laughs> the Fall Guy, which is out yeah. right now, of course, is phenomenal. Love it. Blade Runner 2049. Amazing performance by him. He did La La Land and The Nice Guys in the same year. Both very good. The Big Short. A small role, but he does it well. Um, Gangster Squad. Not as good. Does a good role in it. Drive. Crazy Stupid Love. Uh, it's just like The Notebook. You know, it's a bit yeah. more romancy kind of stuff. But he still does good work in it. Ryan Reynolds. Damn it. <laughs> Ryan Goslin. <laughs> Was in Morbius, for God's sake. No, other way around. No. No, Gosling was not in Morbius. It says here he was in Morbius. Where? I don't know. That's what I'm looking into. I don't think... He, it's not listed on his filmography. It's on Google. Well, Google's fucked. <laughs> <laughs> Let me look here. Let me look here. Okay, let's see. I don't know where it's pulling that from. I'm not sure where it's pulled from either because I can't find shit. The theme of today is Google really fucked over their uh, search engine. Yeah, it's bad. Yeah. It actually, okay. Let me actually, this, this, this genuinely could be from the same shit. Oh, okay. Or no, I'm sorry. This is like all just cyclical. Um, but it may have been from like original cast listings that never panned out mm, mm. that it's pulling from. Um, okay. Last couple things to, to burn through here before we get to the main event. Uh, from last weekend, I saw the TV glow. Uh, teenager Owen is trying to make it through life in the suburbs when his classmate introduces him to a mysterious late night TV show, a vision of a supernatural world beneath their own. In the pale glow of the television, Owen's view of reality begins to crack. Uh, mostly pointing this out because it is an A24 film. It's getting much better critical reception than their last outing uh, Civil War did. And it generally just seems like an interesting kind of like horror take on it of the whole like ooh person in the tv is evil but their own twist so That's not cool. much to say here not not yeah. much to of uh, note to point out but it is doing pretty well uh and we got another stinker atlas you heard about this no please go on it's jennifer lopez's latest flick okay i'm out 
A brilliant data analyst with a deep distrust of AI finds it may be her only hope when a mission to capture a renegade robot goes awry. What the fuck is this? I'm actually curious to see if I can find like a bit more of a comprehensive description because that is just so nothing. Well, so are the reviews, apparently. Yeah, it's not great. Okay, Atlas 2024 plot. Atlas Shepard, an analyst with a deep distrust of artificial intelligence, searches for fugitive AI terrorist Harlan, who, 28 years ago, led an AI rebellion that left 3 million dead before fleeing into outer space. After one of Harlan's agents is captured and interrogated, Atlas discovers that Harlan has escaped to a planet in the Andromeda Galaxy and insists that she accompanies the military mission to find and capture him. Before the mission can launch from orbit, the ship carrying the mech-equipped military hangars is attacked attacked by Harlan's drones. In order to survive, Atlas is forced to enter a mech herself and falls to the planet as the ship is destroyed. Atlas manages to gain basic control of the mech despite her distrust of the onboard AI, who introduces itself as Smith. Atlas orders Smith to head to the planned drop point where she finds the rest of the rangers dead. She reluctantly agrees to directly interface her mind with Smith, allowing for greater control of the mech. As they journey towards the rescue pod, Atlas and Smith begin to bond as she reveals to him and she, and she reveals to him that her mother was the one who created Harlan. Although running low on power, Atlas convinces Smith to head to Harlan's base in order to tag it for a long-range strike. However, after placing a beacon at the base, Smith is hacked and disabled, which basically just confirms all of her fears and suspicions about it. Uh, Atlas is captured and brought to Harlan, who plans to destroy most of humanity and give the chosen survivors a chance to thrive under AI guidance. To do so, Harlan had lured the military to his planet so he could steal a ship and a, a, a carbon bomb, which will burn Earth's atmosphere. After extracting security codes from her brain to get past Earth's defenses, Harlan leaves Atlas to die with Colonel Banks, the only other survivor of the mission. After Banks gives her his mech neural interface device, Atlas remotely reactivates Smith, who comes to their rescue. Atlas further reveals to Smith that Harlan killed her mother after he convinced a young Atlas into interfacing her mind with his, making him aware of humanity's fear of AI. Uh, sorry. After he convinced a young Atlas into interfacing his mind with his, making him aware of humanity's fear of AI. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. After Smith helps Atlas overcome her guilt for her actions, Atlas and Smith fight their way out and destroy Harlan's ship before defeating him in hand-to-hand -hand combat. A heavily damaged Smith shuts down before Atlas is rescued. Back on Earth, Atlas is informed that Harlan's CPU is being analyzed. Atlas, now a ranger, later tests the newest model of mech created with her suggested modifications. As she boots up the new mech, its AI is implied to be Smith, suggesting that his programming has survived. Only on Netflix. So here's a, r a rule of writing for all you aspiring mm -hmm. writers out of here. Mm -hmm. When I hear the phrase, go to the Andromeda Galaxy... I clock the fuck out. <laughs> yep. Uh, can I give another tip as well? Go Don't on. Don't line for line steal from fucking Titanfall. Is that Titanfall? Really? Almost ex exactly. With the, the only difference being the... So Titanfall, the video game, Titanfall 2 specifically, the entire story is that there's, obviously you have the Titanfall Max, and you your character is a guy who is not a pilot yet, but wants to be, and the entire story is him bonding with the Titanfall mech until the Titanfall mech has to sacrifice him at the end to save the pilot, and then at the very end you find out that they're able to save his memory core. Mm. It's like... The last three quarters is one to one. It's like, what if Titanfall, but the guy was kind of reluctant about interfacing with the AI because it's 2024 and AI is a buzzword. AI is quite a buzzword. I wouldn't be surprised if this becomes one of our most viewed episodes just because of how much we said fucking AI <laughs> and Google has a hard on for that. Oh, uh, we'll see. That would be very funny if it happened. Wouldn't it? I'm going like, to like, I'm going to reach for numbers this time. I, I hope that happens because it would be just the funniest thing ever if Google's SEO backfired on them and it's just us shitting on them for two and a half hours. <laughs> uh, but yeah, 16% <laughs> critic score. Not great. Uh, and now, 
the main feature, big release of this weekend. Thing that everyone's talking about. Oh no. The Garfield movie. <sighs> I hate Mondays. <laughs> Garfield, the world-famous, Monday-hating, lasagna-loving indoor cat, is about to have a wild outdoor adventure. After an unexpected reunion with his long-lost father, scruffy street cat Vic. Okay, let's just pause for a second here. Yeah. I... I wish the rest of, like, the whole movie, I wish it was as funny as this little blurb is. Because this is, like... I, I have to imagine this is like they had this like two sentence thing here and that was like their pitch. And it's just like Garfield, voiced by Chris Pratt, reunites with his long lost father, Scruffy, voiced by Samuel L. Jackson. I would spend a hundred million dollars on that. That sounds amazing. I don't know. Not enough celebrity names in there. Can you please go on? I'm scared now. <laughs> Uh, yes, one sec. Uh, so yes, um, Garfield and his canine friend Odie are forced from their perfectly pampered life into joining Vic in a hilarious high-stakes heist. So, it's a heist movie? Yeah. What the fuck are they stealing, my patience? God, this cast makes me sad. Let me, this let... is how it is. I think it's mostly just the state of particularly American animation has just gotten so commoditized that anybody who I hold respect for who ends up involved with it, I just have to be like, come on. Like, Ving Rhames is in this. Nicholas Holt plays John Arbuckle. What are you guys doing? You're better than this. I guess it's a paycheck, but like, man. Snoop Dogg is in this. Yeah, Snoop Snoop Dogg playing his uh, world famous role of Snoop Cat. I'm actually curious. I hope, given that this is a heist movie, I hope that Snoop Cat is like a detective. Ooh, that'd be kind of fun. I can't find what they're trying to steal. What are they trying to steal in this heist movie? Oh, would you look at that Discord crash, everybody? Hi, Cairo, are you there? I am here. We the crashed. Google the movie was <laughs> could not handle our spicy truths. Oh my gosh! I was trying to figure out what they're trying to steal in this heist movie, but I can't <laughs> find it in this chunk of text. I'm not going to read it. Uh, I, I pulled up the uh, the the Holy Bible, the Garfield Wiki. Oh God! So that we can learn about Snoop Cat. Okay, please. I, I want to know the Snoop Cat lore. Snoop Cat is a character from the Garfield movie. He is one of the cats in an animal shelter. That's uh, that's it. I will now proceed to cry. <laughs> oh no! Wait, sorry. There's more. Snoop Cat is likely an animated anthropomorphic feline incarnation of Snoop Dogg. <laughs> it's Who, from the good book. You know it has to be true. Who is the shit-eating mod who wrote that? It's great. In more seriousness, though, so there's apparently like, I don't know if you'd call this a deep cut, but it's like a cut. Uh, yeah. Snoop Cat resembles one of the members of The Claws, a tough alley cat gang who terrorized Garfield's family for years in Garfield on the Town. The Claws member is also large and blueferred with a pink nose and eye patch. What so while it may be a say? reference to that, it is not one to one. This is what happens. Oh, wait, fuck. No, I don't want. <laughs> no. We've already done the Forbes bit. We've already done the Forbes bit. God damn it. This is what happens when you Google Snoop Cat. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's pretty good. Why did I don't, I don't get? Why didn't they do that for the movie? 
<laughs> I don't know. It's literally just that's what that's a Snoop Cat. It is pretty good on the Snoop Cat Garfield wiki page. They apparently have like a form for here for uh, physical appearance, personality, appearances, and then further trivia. The personality field has literally nothing. For shizzle, it's just it's it's just empty. Oh God! So <laughs> that's a good sign. Do you want to get Jesus? <laughs> I'm so glad. Did you see the thing where uh, Elon posted some bullshit on Twitter where he's just like, we've done great to cut down on the number of bots on our app. We're really proud of it. And somebody responded with the, I would like this tweet on a t-shirt thing. And like five <laughs> bots immediately responded. That's amazing. I love that. Would you like to see the worst thing ever? Please. The t-shirt bots are out and they are in force for the Garfield movie. <laughs> I hate you can it. Buy the, you can buy that. I don't want to buy it. Do you want to take a guess how much that costs? Oh, oh no, sorry. You got to get the hoodie. I was going to ask if you can get that Snoop Cat Garfield movie t-shirt for less than a future off. CEO of Forbes black baby onesie. Uh th- that was 28, right? Yeah, about 28.90. Yeah. Uh you can, but only if you get the t-shirt version. Okay. Uh which is kind of strange because the tank top, less material, costs more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So thirty bucks for the tank top, a whole twenty-two for the t-shirt, and if you want the sweatshirt, that's the big bucks. That's forty-two. That's disgusting. <laughs> Someone would have to pay me to wear that. Uh, yeah, pretty much. Uh, in more seriousness, the actual big release for this weekend is Furiosa, a Mad Max saga, the latest in. Uh, George Miller's ongoing I don't know what you call it I guess Mad Max Saga (laughs) yes apparently the vast majority of the script for Furiosa started as like scraps that he had from basically like the world book that he wrote when he was doing excuse me when he, he wrote when he was doing Fury Road okay which is kind of cool, and it makes a lot of sense when you watch it. Uh, mm-hmm. Tonally, it is obviously you know it's a different story than Fury Road, and Fury Road is uh, I think ev- everyone I've seen pretty well agrees that Fury Road is the uh, more entertaining of the two, the better of the two, but they are very obviously meant to be uh, two parts to the same thing, mm-hmm. and it's cool how they inform each other. I really enjoyed that, particularly for some of the side characters or not necessarily side characters, but, you know, not meat characters in Fury Road gives a little bit more meat to their characterizations and their motivations. That was kind of cool. That um, does sound kind of cool. Also, notably, has it shows more of the the world of Fury Road, right? You get to see uh, Gastown and the Bullet Farm, and that's pretty cool. Hmm. Um, and importantly, it very explicitly confirms that Mad Max happens in Australia. We all knew it, but there's no question now. It opens with a big, like, hand shot down from, like, the atmosphere of the Earth down. You see Australia, and then it zooms in all the way. So it's like, yep, it's Australia. I was really hoping. Just just to be sure. (laughs) They were just going down the highway really fast. And then someone yeah. throws something out of a car and it's a can of Vegemite. <laughs> so the thing is, though, is the, and, and I guess that's one thing that is kind of like an unconfirmed kind of still is that, and I guess maybe unconfirmed is not the right way to put it. All of the Mad Max movies are kind of told as like fables in a way, almost. They're not meant to be so literal as much as 
a story being told to people around a campfire about something that happened in the past. Mm, okay. And Fur- Furiosa really leans into that at times in very effective ways. Um, I don't want to go into spoilers, of course, because it just came out this weekend, but I did see it. I do highly recommend it. It is maybe not more graphic than Mad Max Fury Road, but the type of graphicness that is shown feels a lot more emotional and brutal. Okay. Um, in a way that could be uh, more upsetting, I would say. It gets very intense at times. Furiosa goes through some shit. So you're saying bring the kids. Absolutely. Bring the dog. They'll love I, it. I don't have a dog. I got a cat. Well, they might not like it quite so much. There's lots of dogs in the movie. Oh. Do they get hurt? They'd do some hurting. Okay. Then I'm not going to bring my cat. <laughs> um, But yeah, other than that, uh, like the highlights for it, Chris Hemsworth is awesome. Plays the role to a T. He's Australian, of course, so it's cool to see him get to play an extremely Australian character. Um, and he very much, you know, he's not like the most intimidating villain, but he does a very good job of portraying the villain that he is. You know, I heard something very interesting about this movie. Because mm-hmm. with it, we have now a full collection of the original four Avengers as villains now. That's true. We do. Which I kind of find that a little charming, and I want them all to become like uh, a a crossover villain movie now. I guess it depends on who you're considering as like the the Avengers, right? Well, okay, by this, I'm going with the main four. So uh, Chris Evans, Mark Ruffalo, Downey, and Hemsworth. Okay. Yeah. Are you doing like Knives Out for Evans? Yes. Fair enough. What was Robert Downey Jr.'s? Uh, Oppenheimer. I I guess so. He's the villain of that movie. He's definitely an antagonist. Yeah. Okay, but what about Mark Ruffalo though? I'm I'm kind of lost there. Um, let me see. Giving. I haven't seen Foxcatcher, so I don't know about that one. He was apparently the antagonist in Poor Things. I have no idea what that is. Poor Things. Oh, I do know what that is. That was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. That's that's actually legitimate, I think. <laughs> oh, what, and Chris Evans in Knives Out was not? Well, it is more... It, Yo. I mean, from the perspective of antagonist versus villain. Put it okay, way. fair, 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 fair. In- intention, right? Yeah. How would they view themselves? Like, like Chris Hemsworth as Dementus absolutely considers themselves to be a villain, right? <laughs> I'd put it that way. And there is no question. Um, but yeah, it's very much the kind of thing where it's like, if you liked Fury Road, I think you will like this. Mm. Um. One piece of criticism that's actually for the trailers more than anything is that, and maybe this is like partly like George Miller's fault, he makes his movies too pretty. Hmm. Where at very specific points in the movie, you will absolutely see a scene and it'll be like, oh yeah, that was the piece from the trailer. Because he's just got such a good job at making like every frame memorable that even though in the context of the scene, all of these shots are incredibly well composed. The lighting and the colors are excellent, but it's just like, Oh yeah, that was the one they used in the trailer. So that's a bit of a, a a bit awkward. So you're saying we need to cancel them for being too good. Exactly. Got it. Apparently, there's also some really cool like digital aging stuff that they do in it because the movie starts with 
uh, Furiosa when she's like 10 years old. Okay. And progresses through like 20 years of her life. So the Furiosa as a child is, let me see if I can actually find it, uh, portrayed by Alila Brown. And then obviously, Untila Joy plays her when she is, uh, you know, like young adult. And then uh, Charlize Theron plays Furiosa and Fury Road. And they did some really cool, subtle, um, but like digital uh, aging stuff to make uh, Alila Brown and Anya Taylor Joy kind of like have less of a like a jump between this is one actress to the other. Mm hmm. And then the same thing for Anna Taylor Joy to Charlize Theron, where it's just like subtle things with the makeup and digital touch up later that was very effective and makes it really hard to tell like when does the switchover happen. And it's like, you know, if you're looking for it, you can see it. But it was very effective and cool to see, especially when we've had such bad, like especially when it comes to like digital de-aging kind of stuff is particularly bad at times. Well, neat. Mm -hmm. So when's it getting an Oscar? Uh, probably whenever the next Oscars are. Damn. Uh, sometime March 2025. Okay. I'll be shocked if it doesn't get nominations at least for cinematography. Though. It absolutely deserves it. George Miller is a fantastic director. Isn't interesting, though? Uh, apparently, because in the wake of uh, Fury Road, both Charlize Theron and Tom Hardy both basically said, this was one of the worst filming experiences I ever had, and I will not do another one of these movies. <laughs> and uh, Anya Taylor-Joy said basically the exact same thing after this. And I'm sure part of that, is, or probably a large part of that, maybe, is just the fact that you're like, out in the middle of fucking Australia for weeks at a time in like the actual desert. And that probably really fucking sucks. But yeah, it's more than just a coincidence at this point. <laughs> I would say so. Yeah. But that is all I've got. Damn dude. It's a big week because you know, Catching up, but there's also just like we're we're very much ramping up into the the summer movie time. Oh yeah, this is like my favorite time because you get to start in yeah. appreciating what's about to come. Yeah, yeah. And there's there's some good ones actually. While while we're here, let me see if I can find this. Um, is it like American Saga? Ad I saw at the theater. Horizon, an American Saga. This is a Kevin Costner project. Uh, big gamble that I'm going to be very interested to see how it pays off, sort of regardless of the content of it. We can deal with that when it gets a bit closer. Um, chapter one for it releases June 28th. Chapter two releases in August of the same year. So they basically made like a five hour movie and are releasing it in two portions. Hmm. And it's going to be really interesting to see if it works. Like, is that a way that you can stretch uh, a smaller budget by breaking it up across two movies that release over a short period of time? Is that more of a risk? Because if people see the first one and it sucks, you're already out by the time the second one comes around. There's a lot of questions that are going to be interesting to see answered related to the financial structure that they decided to do for this. So, yeah. Haven't, as far as I can remember, at least, I don't think I've ever seen a project work like that with such a short gap between releases. Hmm. I just thought, realized that Borderlands is coming out soon. Yeah. That's not going to be good. No. I'm not <laughs> particularly optimistic on it. Apparently, we have a trailer. Yeah, I, I remember the trailer. I must have missed it. You didn't miss anything. <laughs> Maybe I've just forgotten it. <laughs> Maybe you're doing yourself a favor. Maybe. God, it is a weird year for movies. Hmm. 
You know what it's not a weird year for? What's that? Doctor fucking who. Yeah, tell me about that. Uh, I'll say, I don't have my Disney Plus subscription anymore, but it sounds like my parents might be wanting to get one of their own because they can't mooch off of mine. So there's a chance I could could see these. Oh, hell yeah. Uh, They're good. Um, Yeah. So we've got four episodes, halfway through the season already, because they did a two-episode drop. Um, The first episode, Space Babies. Mm Mm-hmm. Oddly charming. Probably not a great episode as a whole, but I found some charm in it. Uh, premise is basically, what if Star Trek was run by babies? Hmm. Um, it's cute. Babies mm-hmm. are a little creepy at times, but it's just fun. It's fun that's shit. an interesting idea. Yeah. They and have and a that's monster. a good sign for a doctor. You gotta have good ideas to start with. I can't remember where I read it. But there was, like, this thing about the rule to writing good sci-fi, right? hmm I think you're going to appreciate this, too. The idea of writing a good sci-fi is predicting the car, but going one step forward and predicting the traffic jam and writing a story about the traffic jam. That's good. That's smart. That's a good it, way of putting it. Yeah. So this Space Babies episode, they have a nanny who kind of, like, stays off to the side. And the basic conflict is that the babies have a monster on board. That's the boogeyman. And it's about saving these babies from their own worst nightmares, basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, the second one, which I was excited for, it's called The Devil's Chord. Uh, it was the Beatles uh, episode. I'm a fan of the Beatles. That is the most mixed reception I've ever had to a Doctor Who episode. Okay, so as a episode that was centered around the Beatles... How many times do you think the Beatles show up in that episode? Oh, God. I, I, you know, if this was like Doctor Who circa 1970, they would be the companion for the episode. <laughs> you would think, right? So it's, uh, it's either if, if they haven't gone that route, and I assume they haven't because it's not 1970 anymore. I assume they show up like once. Three times. Three times. And only two yeah. of them get to speak. Yeah. Yeah. Um, overall though, it was interesting. It's like a sequel to the toy maker episode. Yeah. 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 So you get, you get another celestial being like the toy maker and shooty got doctor. Number 15 It's basically like, ah, uh, fuck. No, I'm leaving. <laughs> Run away. Okay. Yeah. Um, then we get to the two very good episodes. Here's the concept, right? The doctor steps on a uh, a smart landmine and has to figure out how to disarm it. And the only way to disarm the smart landmine is to end a war and he can't get off the uh, landmine. Interesting. So he has to end the war so the landmine deactivates? Yes. Okay. Because the way it works is that the landmine is trying to tell if he's a corpse that landed on it or if he's a live person. Mm. So he's got to stand perfectly still. And find a way to turn it off. Only way it's turning off is if the war's ended. Mm-hmm. That's good. It is a good one. It's it's honestly I thought it would be the best one in the season. <laughs> and then a couple nights ago, uh seventy three yards played. Um that landmine episode, boom, it's called. Written mm-hmm. by Stephen Moffat. I was going to say, I just looked up the Wikipedia page and it's just like, oh yeah, that's like the one Stephen Moffat episode is his ghost still haunts them. <laughs> yeah. And it's really weird because like you can tell he was writing it and he didn't know too much about the 15th doctor mm-hmm. and he writes it basically as just the 12th doctor episode. I think that's kind of good. A good idea for doctor who is it's just to write it for not the actor, but the doctor. Yeah. And it's very good. Cause shooty got is like, it's just a monologue episode. And he he's is—he's a great selling. actor. He's—I underestimated him. I knew he was a good actor, but I didn't realize he was just that good. Like this man deserves awards mm-hmm. today. And then uh, we have seventy-three yards. It's a Doctor Light episode. It is an episode that is very focused on the new companion 
uh, Ruby Sunday, played by Millie Gibson. She deserves awards today. Yeah. Premise of the episode, the doctor randomly disappears, and she is being uh, followed around by a mysterious woman at 73 yards. Every time she tries to walk to the lady, she stands 30, 73 yards further away. Every time that she tries to get someone to talk to the lady, they just look at her in horror after speaking with the lady and run away from Ruby for the rest of her life. Hmm. And it is just so good. It's like, it is a good Doctor Who horror. I don't know where it's going to land at the end of the year, but I I fuck with that episode hard. So, Mr. Cairo, please do yourself a favor and beg Mommy and Daddy for Disney+. Plus. I will do so. <laughs> please don't. I won't beg, but I will definitely be watching it as soon as I can. I, I highly recommend it. Those last two episodes just... They sell it for me. Doctor Who is back. I was a little cautious, but nah, not anymore. Anything else you would like to add to the show today? I don't believe so. Cool. I'm Neef Miss Orion. And I'm a Schmo. And I'm Cairo. And I've been a Schmo. And that's a lie. He's actually been an AI this whole episode, everybody. We got you good. Beep boop. Ha ha ha.